Welcome to the ninth annual Greg Leptuk Award Lecture. I would first like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, seas and waters of the areas that we live, work and meet on around the globe. I acknowledge their continuing connection to their culture and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. The Greg Leptuk Award is the named lecture of the AGU Earth and Space Science Informatics Session, also known affectionately as ESSI. ESSI is a cross-disciplinary section within AGU that focuses on enabling those fundamentals of all modern scientific research, computation, and the acquisition and analysis, accessibility and interoperability of those ever increasingly larger and larger data sets. ESSI is also the bridge to the external information technology community beyond the earth sciences. If you would like to know more, please join the ESSI Town Hall next Tuesday, 15th of December, 7 to 8 a.m. at Pacific time. The ESSI Greg Leptuk Lecture is presented annually and recognizes significant contributions to data science through research, education and related activities. It is given to a mid-career researcher or senior scientist. The Leptuk Lecture aims to raise awareness of new computational and data advances that enable and enhance scientific discovery. The lecture award honors the life of Greg Leptuk, an earth scientist who was very active in the then embryonic informatics community and who worked on projects related to data quality and data provenance. More importantly, Greg also recognized the value of community infrastructures as critical enablers of data sharing and data delivery. He truly was an early advocate of the building of common data infrastructures through open community collaborations. Leptuk was first awarded in 2012, the year of Greg's untimely death. And Aaron Robinson is now the ninth recipient of the award. But what is so special about this year's awardee is that Erin actually worked with Greg in the early days of her career. Erin still references Greg in nearly every talk she gives with that famous slide about the way science was traditionally done with data download and the burden of local processing and how we need to move to a new way of doing shared science on the cloud, enabled by better data management and above all community coordination and collaboration. Today, Erin's leadership in the global earth and space science informatics community is second to none. As an individual, Erin has been a long-term champion of advancing the principle of open access to quality data. She has been a leader in the creation of shared earth science data infrastructures by bringing teams together to make data more visible and accessible to the broader community. She's also a strong advocate of maximizing the utility of data by ensuring that it can be reused and repurposed by others. Erin also works tirelessly to raise awareness and promote data at all levels. Since 2014, she has been Executive Director of the Earth Science Information Partners, also known as ESIP. Under her charge, ESIP has grown substantially and the increase in community participation has been significant, attracting strong agency acknowledgement and stable funding with NASA, NOAA and the USGS. The ESIP community now has over 160 organizational members and with around 500 individuals directly involved. Erin has also built international engagement for ESIP and for example, has led to the development of a partner organization in Australia, affectionately known as ESIP Down Under. Erin is exceptional as a community builder. She's not just a born connector extraordinaire, but she also has the rare ability to be seen as a neutral broker, respected by all and be seen as the one not taking sides. I cannot think of a candidate for the Leptuk lecture that better embodies Greg's engagement, generosity and long-term focus on improving the earth science informat informatics community than Erin. I think that Erin's contribution to the community is one that Greg, knowing her, would be proud of. Recognition of her contributions through the Leptuk lecture at the end of her tenure as ESIP's director is fitting and perfectly aligned with the goal of the award to recognize significant contributions to informatics computational or data sciences through research, education and related activities. 
Good evening to most of you. It's a great honor for me to be this year's Leptic Lecturer and included alongside many of my friends and mentors. I'd like to express my appreciation to the American Geophysical Union, to the Earth and Space Science Informatics section, and in particular to those that nominated me and supported my nomination. I am humbled um, and I was so surprised. I'm deeply touched by this recognition, um, particularly as I ended my 10 year career with ESIP. And so this year, ESIP focused on putting data to work. That was the theme of the year. And in this talk, I want to explore what it means to put data to work by focusing on the intersection between data intensive science, data management, and collaborative community efforts. Like many of us, I accidentally stumbled into informatics when I saw my first satellite image and images like this beach ball that was created by NASA with multiple different data sets just capture my attention like nothing I've ever seen. And I was hooked. And so that's really where my career started. However, nobody mentioned to me all the work that it was going to take to find, access, download the data, to pre-process it before we did any science. And these, this image really brings together two mentors of mine, Greg Leptuk, who created this, um, the yellow and green boxes on the left side of the screen that show this traditional science approach, project-based approach of, of doing a lot of pre-science work, um, which often feels very Sisyphean before we get to a little bit of time to doing science. And it also brings together my graduate advisor, Rudy Hussar, who is a professor emeritus at Washington University in St. Louis, where he and I spent a lot of time talking about the barriers that users face to open science and open data, that the user has to find the data, has to access them, has to understand the quality of the data, and then has to merge them with other data. And, you know, this is, it's very Sisyphean feeling. Um, and what's more is that many, many, many people are doing the same exact work over and over again um, that doesn't need to be done. This is not, this is well understood pre-processing work or data cleanup or data wrangling, whatever you want to call it. Um, but it's a relic of the download era of data processing and, and science. And so throughout my talk, I'm going to borrow snippets from others that I admire to tell parts of this story about how we're transitioning from traditional science that we downloaded the data to open science um, and to doing science in new ways. And the first person I'd like to introduce is Julie Stewart Lowndes, who is a fellow at NCS um, and was a Mozilla fellow, and she's the founder of OpenScapes. And she talked this summer at the ESIP summer meeting um, as part of our plenary. And she really, I think, frames the problem that these Sisyphean stick figures are facing um, in a really um, wonderful way. So with that, I will let Julie take it away. So the problem I'm trying to solve from a scientist's perspective is that despite the power of open data science, many scientists are still struggling with data and code, and we're doing this as individuals. And this is because we're rarely trained to work responsibly with data, and we're also not trained to collaborate and work like a team. So this creates a culture where we don't feel confident sharing our data analysis, and we're also not open about our challenges. And this is true even within a research lab that is studying the same study system. And this situation then creates invisible friction when forming data-driven partnerships because people aren't on the same page with what's possible or how they can participate. So this has been a problem for a long time, but it matters now because we're perpetuating these homegrown and non-inclusive practices and there's no time to waste. And the new wave of scientific leaders who are faculty and lecturers and program managers will not by default lead this transition to open data science because many of them have never seen it or experienced it themselves as a beneficial way to work. And despite wanting better practices for their labs, they feel unqualified and unsupported to establish these on their own. So a contributing solution is to welcome scientists to open data science and empower them with these resilient habits and mindsets and to do this as teams. So I'll describe this much more throughout the whole talk, but I like to illustrate how it feels to be a scientist in this situation using analogies from Star Wars. 
So this is Luke Skywalker after he crashed his plane in the swamp of Dagobah. And he is here not able to solve the challenge in front of him with the skill sets that he has. And it's demoralizing and it's lonely. And if you imagine that he, was attempt that he attempted to use whatever he had on hand, whatever pulleys or ropes that were in his X-wing, you know it wouldn't have been reproducible. It, it wouldn't have been something he was really proud of. And it probably wouldn't have gotten him to where he needed to be on time. But luckily, what happens next is that he meets Yoda. And Yoda uses the force to solve Luke's problem in a way Luke never imagined was possible. And this is gonna open up Luke's whole world because he can learn from Yoda and not only solve his current challenge, but it's gonna broaden his mindset to what's possible in the future and the scale of the challenges that he can take on. But Luke didn't go on to defeat the empire alone. He had a whole community. And this community was super powerful because of its diversity of backgrounds and expertise. And not everybody was a Jedi using the force but everyone was contributing in really critical ways to this shared vision that they had. So I love the imagery in Julie's talk, and I love how she describes um, coming together and partnering. And there are really two things that I want you to take away from this snippet. One is that you all are Jedi's. Um, it's the ESIP community and the Earth Science and the Earth Science and Space Informatics section that's providing these new ways of doing science and new ways of thinking about how to work with scientific data. And that's something that many scientists across AGU sections have never thought of before. And so I think that's a really vital role that SEA is providing is this reimagining of the way that we can be working with data and the things that we can do because of the tools that exist now and the community that exists now. The other thing that I really like about um, this talk is about how Julie points out that Luke wouldn't have been proud of what he had fixed alone um, or with the existing tools that he had. And I think that that's something that I want us to think about, you know, how it is that, you know, scientists that feel overwhelmed with their data um, and aren't sure about new, um, new guidance coming from journals, that they feel like they don't have any solutions. And so it's this partnering really that I think will bring science forward. And when Julie gave her talk this summer, it resonated deeply. It hit home with the fact that I've been in such a unique space, unlike my isolated Sisyphean stick figures, I've been drawn toward community and creating community as I've gone. And while the leptic lecture often recognizes someone who's made a substantial technical contribution, I'm really honored that my work supporting the community is acknowledged as a worthy contribution to our field. Earth Science Informatics is inherently collaborative and making connections and identifying what we can do in common is therefore critical to the work. So my passion for Earth Science data and particularly remotely sensed data um, and for um, working together in communities really has led my career to be summed up in this little um, equation of data plus community equals action. So Malcolm Gladwell writes in his book, The Tipping Point, about the idea that there's a moment of critical mass, the threshold or a boiling point where small things can make a big difference. At last year's AGU, as I was showing my Sisyphean stick figures, it hit me that it wasn't that they were all isolated, rolling the same ball up the hill over and over, but really it was collectively as a community, we have been moving the ball forward. So tonight, I want to talk through the tipping point from science as it's been traditionally done to science, um, to open science, which allows us to explore new questions because we have the technology, the expertise, the collaborative infrastructure, and the community to explore them. I hesitated to use the tipping point because it's based on understanding infectious disease epidemics, and that's a lot of what Gladwell writes about. And we understand going viral in a very personal way this year. And I certainly I hope that all of you are healthy and safe and that this COVID interruption has just been a slight stay at home and not impacted your health. Um, I have missed our community this, this year um, and it is such a strange time. All of that said, I really think that what we're doing 
is transforming the way that we're doing science and that these ideas are really um, useful in how, how I can communicate this. And so to modify what Gladwell says about infection, transformative change in open science is a function of the people who transmit the ideas, the idea itself, and the environment in which the ideas are operating in. Gladwell writes about three types of people necessary to achieve a tipping point. Connectors, people with a special gift for bringing the world together, particularly different types of people. And in, this has been the thread through my work was to be a connector in the earth science informatics community. Gladwell talks about mavens, which comes from the Yiddish word, and it means one who accumulates knowledge. But I think what I love about mavens is that not only do they accumulate knowledge, but they really want to share that knowledge with others. They like to be helpers. And many of you are mavens. You've been collecting knowledge about stewarding earth science data and your masters at your craft, and you're passionate about helping others understand. And then there are the salespeople who persuade us when we're unconvinced of what we're hearing. And we all take some role here in being salespeople to help persuade others the value of earth science data stewardship. So as I mentioned, I've been a connector my whole life. And when I read about connectors, it gave me language to describe what I've been doing. This is me in fifth grade. And this is nearly the first newsletter that I wrote for my family. From fifth grade, I went on to coordinate and facilitate groups, particularly in ESIP. And I'm going to cover some of the activities as I go of things that have come out of these partnerships. But in preparing for this talk, I thought I didn't have anything to share because being a connector is no big deal to me. It's something that comes naturally. And Gladwell reminded me that connectors are critical. And as he said, they're the people who link us up with the world and the people with a special gift for bringing the world together. And so that leads to ESIP. Over the last 10 years, I've supported and co-created ESIP and the broader geoinformatics community by lowering barriers to collaboration. So just like I've wanted to lower barriers to open science users using open data, really through ESIP, my goal has been to lower the barrier to collaboration so that all of you can work well together. And this first image shows a very simple network map that I created. And it's one of the, the next times. So satellite imagery gave me that jolt of, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. But seeing even this simple network map of the ESIP community suddenly made it real. These are connections between ESIP partners and their types. Um, so we have researchers, application developers, and research product creators, application developers, and repositories all coming together. Um, and these links show that initial partnership. We've abstracted that diagram over the, the last several years, and this really encompasses and simplifies the fact that we're coming together across these different types around different um, topics in the data life cycle. We bring people together across the data life cycle. And I think one of the newer things that's happened is that while ESIP has been US um, based for its entire life, we know that these common data challenges are not unique to, um, to the US. And so it's been really exciting to grow this partnership to E2SIP, the Earth and Environmental Science Information Partners, and also the second ESIP, um, which is the same kind of coordinating body in Australia, and they link up um, around common clusters, so we're not recreating the wheel. And together, this community coming together across these different types really is a leader in promoting the collection, stewardship, and use of earth science data. And it is more than the sum of its parts. When I think about the kind of things that ESIP has impacted over the last 20 years of its life, um, ESIP has become the place where earth science data experts um, come together. And so we support that coming together at the organizational level um, and the human level. And when I was thinking about this, I realized that ESIP is really the kind of the connector organization as I am a connector person. Um, and maybe that's why we've gotten along so well. But ESIP provides infrastructure at the collaborative level 
um, so both virtual and in-person infrastructure that allows for people to find each other and to solve common problems. And they generate recommendations, they agree on ways to use standards and conventions, and they go back to their home institutions and go down this interoperability stack and actually implement the things that they've agreed on and discussed and learned. Um, and that's furthering interoperability. So we are making progress because we have this space to collaborate in teams um, and then go back to our home institutions and actually implement. Things ESIP doesn't do, we don't provide data, we're not a cyber infrastructure, we don't compete with our members, um, and we don't develop standards. But we have partners with all of, all of these kind of organizations that do do those things. And so that leads me to the ESIP collaboration areas. And this is another um, part of that initial network map that I created. Um, and it shows how out of ESIP really blooms all of these um, activities and clusters and committees that are based on community need and interest. So ESIP as an organization doesn't um, define these topics. These are member driven and member led. And it's really led to, I think, an interesting effect. And so I wanted to pause here and to share a short clip from Bruce Karen, a longtime ESIP community member, community architect, and the founder of the new media studio on his observations about ESIP clusters. And this clip is part of a talk that he gave during the 2012 ESIP summer meeting. Let's start with the network effect. We're here to network, and the value of being a member of a network is generally quantified using Metcalfe's law, which tells us that the network value increases as the square of the number of its members. And so, by linking through ESIP, you expand your reach exponentially. Now, that's also true of any open e network, but ESIP goes further. Reed's law looks at networks that have the capability of creating subgroups what ESIP calls clusters. The ability to easily spin up as many subgroups as are desired creates a new network effect with a theoretical value that approaches 2 to the n, a value that accumulates much faster than Metcalfe's original network effect. What does this mean? For one thing, this explains how clusters defeat the curse of the power law curve. Now the power law curve is how actual work in open networks usually gets distributed. It's the curve which says that 10% of members do 90% of the work. In an open network, most open source projects fail because they need to attract hundreds of members to secure a handful of active contributors, but they cannot engage the long tail. So ESIP comes along and asks these long tail folks, well, what's your biggest problem? Why not start your own clusters and get to work? ESIP breaks the long tail into any number of small, engaged subgroups. It's brilliant. ESIP now has more than 10 years of small team collaboration. So I think this highlights how ESIP has been an interesting community, both because of how it's attracted experts and grown over time, and also how we've put those experts to work through clusters and have gained this efficiency um, of having many clusters working on many different activities over time. And I also think that there's an efficiency of the clusters being adjacent to each other. And so there's some awareness that rubs off um, through meetings and through, you know, ESIP all emails that go out um, that these things are not happen happening in complete isolation. So that leads me to look a little bit um, at my history of where I came from. And one of the first projects that I was working on was with the Air Quality Community of Practice. And I'm bringing this up because it was really one of the first attempts that I'm aware of where we were coming together, orienting our um, professional jobs around this community activity in a way that we could all make progress um, and doing it in this open space. So this is an example of a way to work, um, and I hope that there's some value here as I share. Um, it was also, it's a collaboration with those that you see on the screen, including people from my group, Stefan Falk and Rudy Hussar, um, Frank and Chris and Greg were all at NASA, um, and then we had collaborators from EPA and from DLR. So it was truly an international effort um, in this space. So what we understood as a group was that the traditional project approach of having a stove piped system wasn't working for us. 
we understood from the science perspective, which I think is interesting to note that um, we were both the scientist and the technologist here, that there were lots of different air quality data sets that could be brought together and reused for many different purposes that you see on the screen. And we realized that we needed to do this in a community of practice sort of way. So we utilized the air quality cluster um, to use as a backbone infrastructure for that collaborative infrastructure I mentioned. Um, and we also participated in GEO, the group on earth observations. Um, and then on the infrastructure side of things, we were very interested in using the global earth observing system of systems infrastructure. And we were participating in a pilot um, where there were many other groups that were also trying to use GEOS. And so this was a great example for me really early of how um, common data challenges across domain could be solved collectively when we were orienting around the same, um, the same problem and the same challenge. And so we took this, um, this sort of vision and we agreed on a set of standards that we were going to use. And here, what I just want to point out is that we were able to um, pilot and show data reuse as possible through the service-oriented architecture and by using standards. And so GIS um, had a set of a standards registry and we chose to follow that standards registry and use standards and that allowed us to complete, complete this loop. This also is a, an early example of moving away from the data download way of doing science and towards this um, web service method of doing science. And so when I came into the research group, my job was really around um, creating the air quality metadata record that was needed to go along with these web accessible web services, the OGC web services. So data providers had provided their um, service to um, through data accessible services. And then we were creating this record that had um, the red and the yellow boxes were needed for the GIOS clearinghouse metadata. And then we added air quality specific terms to help our users down here um, be able to search on terms that they were familiar with. And then we included this purple box of data binding or the, um, the web service information needed for um, access. And so what we were attempting to do here really is to improve the experience that the user was having. Um, you know, the burden wasn't anymore that they had to go and find the um, website, they had to go and download the data, but they were able to immediately find through a client of their choice um, and through the tool of their choice, pulling in these web services um, to find and access the data all at once. And in a little more human readable format, um, we were, um, we had project A, which combined data from one set, we then were able to um, add data from another project into the same distributed and federated approach, but find it through the clearinghouse. And then project C was able to use data that they found and accessed through, um, through the clearinghouse. And all of this, um, as I interrupt my look back, um, is fair. This was findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable before we had the term fair. Um, and I really want to emphasize the interoperability and reuse and that that was possible because we as a community had agreed on collective standards that we were going to implement. So we had a distributed set of data providers all um, using standards and because of that through the GIOS infrastructure we were able to show this pilot. But it wasn't all that great. It wasn't sustainable. And I'm repurposing this image that's created by Allison Horst for Julie Lowndes talk because I felt like Luke Skywalker with a wrecked plane. The funding ran out. I got a different job, actually moved to ESIP. Um, other team members moved away and the air quality cluster went dormant. But I think the biggest aha I have as I've reflected back on this project is that there was no user community. There was no um, pull of scientists. I mentioned that we were both the technologist and the scientist, so it was interesting for us to innovate here, but we didn't have a user community that wanted it and really was pulling it forward. And I think that was the downfall of, of this project and something that I hadn't really appreciated. 
However, it wasn't all bad news. I'm really happy to report that Giovanni, the platform that Greg Leptuk was part of founding, um, celebrated its 20th anniversary this year and has over 100 publications that are citing Giovanni. So this is one example of where community has been cultivated around an analysis platform and where they are reducing the burden that I, I referenced at the beginning of this talk on the user and really, um, I think, improving science as we know it. Another example is from Krista Hazenkoop. Krista is the OpenAQ founder, and I want her to tell a little bit more about OpenAQ using a clip from her pitch video from Fast Forward Demo Day in 2019. It really picks up from where I'm leaving this story in 2010, um, and it also emphasizes the importance of open data. Take this story, for example, from Beijing, China, a decade ago. The U.S. Embassy began tweeting air quality information from an app, they, uh, from a device they placed on their, their roof. Apps started pulling this information in, and for the first time, real-time air quality information was in the hands of millions of Beijingers. This created a huge public outcry and provoked a series of policy changes. So much so that a decade fast forward, the air quality in Beijing and across China has significantly improved, and you truly can trace this back to that little bit of open data. And this story isn't unique. We see the same story play out in city after city across the world. Communities need access to data so they can affect change, and when that access happens, that change happens. So that's what OpenAQ is all about, providing access to data so that people and communities can take action. We do that by amassing the world's largest air quality data set, and it's the only place where you can access this information openly, uh, globally, and in real time. We've been in operation for a little over three years, and we receive about 15 million data requests to our system every month. These requests come from all across the world, and people are using the OpenAQ platform in more ways than we ever could have originally imagined from scientists who use the platform to forecast air quality, to members of the media who use the platform to do data-driven journalism, to parents like Namita Gupta, who launched a startup to help families protect themselves from air pollution. So I really think that Krista's work with OpenAQ is phenomenal. And I think what we see here is the community that she built around OpenAQ. I love it when she says that people are using the platform in ways that she could not even imagine possible. Um, and so what we see is that she's lowered the barrier um, and the burden on the user to find and access um, and use surface monitoring um, air quality data sets. And because of that, the adoption of that data has been huge. Um, So ESIP turned 20 in 2018, and when we did that, we looked back and we interviewed a lot of our members. And this is a quote from Rama Ramapriyan about um, where we are now. And he said, the possibility of being able to implement things that you thought about 20 years ago because the computational capability is available now is quite exciting. And one of my favorite examples of this kind of computational capability comes from the Pangeo project. And so the last clip I want to show you is um, from Ryan Abernathy in a recent talk that he gave on making ocean data useful. Um, it was part of the convergent sessions harnessing the power of data and people. So I think it's very appropriately sort of tuned with my talk. And where we pick up, he's just described the download problem, um, which I'm not going to reiterate here. And he's talking about moving towards open cloud architecture and the Pangeo community. So I'll let Ryan take it from here. So the alternative, one alternative, is to use what we call open cloud architecture. And by cloud, I just mean any computing resource that combines publicly accessible data with publicly accessible computing. We have amazing tools for interactive scientific computing in programming languages like Python, Julia, and R. And the Jupyter project allows us to interactively interact with our computing system in really novel and creative ways. We also have great parallel computing frameworks like Spark or Dask that allow us to scale our analysis up using hundreds uh, of computers. 
And we also have fantastic analysis-ready data formats that are optimized for cloud storage, such as Parquet, COG, ZAR, and TileDB. Now, all of the th things you see on my screen right now are completely open source and can be deployed in any cloud-like environment, including all of the commercial cloud providers or federally sponsored computing resources like Jetstream or sh the Cheyenne Supercomputer. So the Pangea project is a community platform for big data geoscience that tries to implement this vision through a concrete set of tools. Uh, we started as a grassroots collaboration between scientists and software developers. We got some support from the NSF EarthCube program, and we've grown to include dozens of international partners from academia and industry. Pangeo practices open source community development. I'm not going to get into the details of Pangeo technology, but I'll just say that it's all driven by scientific users and real use cases. And we contribute very broadly across the open source software ecosystem and deploy these tools in a wide range of different environments. And we've been doing this iteratively for several years, and I think we've made really big progress in changing the way we interact with Earth system data. So uh, rather than going through a bunch of technical details and showing a lot of plots, I think a few tweets uh, that I pulled off Twitter really get the point across of the impact our project might be able to have. Uh, here's one from a grad student at University of Washington who participated in one of our hackathons. And he talks about how Pangeo has changed the way he thinks about and hopefully does climate model analysis in the future. So what Ryan shared was that when scientific researchers come together with software developers, they're able to lower some of the barriers and reduce the burden to how scientists are doing large scale analysis on the cloud or other high performance computing resources. So this is another example, again, I think of where we see the community that's been built around Pangeo um, and the kind of sustaining Pangeo where my original project that I shared from the air quality community of practice missed that community. So coming back to the, the FAIR principles, um, there's a quote in that article that says, there's an urgent need to improve the infrastructure supporting the reuse of scholarly data. And I would say that I think that we don't have an infrastructure problem. There's a technology, the technology solutions are there. Um, things like Pangeo, OpenAQ, um, Giovanni, I'll show that the infrastructure for reuse is available. But to me, the real challenge is in the tensions around um, the science data infrastructure. And so the first is the challenge of asking new questions versus the same questions that we have been um, solving. And I think putting, um, going back to the air quality example just briefly, the air quality example was one place where we were forced to ask new questions because that was sort of the way that our domain worked. Um, so we were using data that wasn't intended for us in the first place. There's a tension between technologists and scientists. Many of us have transitioned from scientists to technologists because we needed to solve our data intensive problems. There's a tension between the infrastructure budget and the science budget. When we talk about investing in science data infrastructure and repositories, science budgets, um, sometimes decrease and the scientists say, well, you know, you're taking money away from my science. But I would say we're actually trying to help your science by being efficient with the use of money around the infrastructure. And then there's a tension between research and operations of the scientific data infrastructure itself. And what I mean by this is that it's more likely that scientific data infrastructure will be funded to push some research question, some computer science research question, um, then that it will be to fund operational um, sustainment. And what we know is that scientists don't want their platforms to change over and over, that we want Pangeo to be sustained over time. Um, and we want Giovanni to be sustained over time in ways that we can rely on it and not have to figure out how to use a different tool. So I would modify this statement saying that there's an urgent need to improve the global collaborative infrastructure. It's how do we link things like Pangeo together with other tools um, to support use and reuse. And I think that I also want to just um, 
linger here on the reuse element of this that you know I think it's one thing to ask scientists to share their data but what I would really like us to see and I think there are ways to do this um, is to to highlight and to showcase stories where we're reusing data and where there's new scientific understanding because of reuse. So that led me to think that the tipping point that I was sensing wasn't actually a tipping point. It was actually a tipping point into the chasm. And so I think the air quality work that I was I shared initially um, was part of this innovation space and that you know we crossed a smaller chasm when groups like OpenAQ um, and Giovanni were able to continue on. But that now as a community we're facing this chasm of how do we move scientists, this bulk of the scientists, from the way that they've traditionally been doing work and into this open science and open data um, framework. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how I see the shift happening and how we're crossing the chasm. So Jeffrey Moore says that to cross the chasm we need open science footholds and what I described in the first half of my talk was really the open science footholds using standards in the open um, in the air quality community of practice, consolidating and creating this open data set from OpenAQ and then the analysis platforms with Giovanni and Pangeo. These are all examples and have scientific communities that were using these tools that show that early adoption. In addition, Jeffrey Moore also says that in order to cross the chasm, we need to have partnerships and alliances with other vendors who serve the open science industry. And this is kind of business speak for um, who are our other stakeholders. And so the partners that I, I want to focus on um, that I think are helping us cross the chasm are data managers and technologists, which have been an active part of ESIP, as well as publishers, scientists, and academic societies like AGU. So ESIP has a long um, history, over 20 years, of building these partnerships across some of these stakeholders. And so one of the best examples of building partnerships comes from the ESIP data citation guidelines. It brought together data managers um, first, and they agreed on these data citation guidelines. And then as it was adopted, it acted as a link between society, scientists, and publishers as well. One of the key things about um, citation really is the need for identifiers and citations include an identifier often a DOI for papers data sets or software um, but we also have seen other identifiers um, emerge ORCID for people, ROARS for organizations um, and this really allows us to make that linkage so just like the network map that I showed of ESIP um, and how ESIP people are connecting around the collaboration areas we're able to show these connections between research artifacts and people because of the identifiers and the linkages, which I think is really exciting. And then that brings in ResCognito, which we are also piloting within ESIP um, as a way to give people credit for things that are not traditionally given credit for, things like submitting a session to a meeting or um, participating in a cluster. So it helps, it's gonna help us visualize this contribution to the communities through the use of identifiers and credit. So another partnership that we've seen um, forming that's helping, I think, shape the environment and uh, move scientists across the chasm has been in the ESIP data management training space. And that really brought data managers and technologists together to create the training, and then they've given the trainings um, to scientists and collaborated with scientists to continue to iterate. ESIP has also understood that we're not alone in this space, and so we created the Data Management Training Clearinghouse as a place to bring together lots of different training material from all sorts of partners that are part of ESIP and adjacent to ESIP. I think one thing here again, coming back to this theme of reuse, is that I would really love to have stories of how content that's been contributed to the Data Management Training Clearinghouse is being reused in a new and novel way. So my favorite partnership is the Data Help Desk. And the Data Help Desk brings together many of our stakeholders. It brings together data managers and technologists and publishers as experts. Societies provide this awesome platform for us to reach out. And then scientists are, um, are, are here at Fall AGU. Um, so this gives you a sense of what a data help desk in person looks like. And many of you are probably familiar with this um, from past AGU meetings. I think this is our fourth or our fifth data help desk. 
but it really provides researchers and um, data experts with this opportunity to build relationships at the data help desk and then to carry those forward. Um, and so this is a, these are pictures from Ocean Sciences, the last in-person data help desk that we had. And we've since COVID, we have pivoted into the virtual space. Um, and we have really, I think, made the best of, of a virtual situation. Um, so at GSA, we had 55 resources that were contributed that included videos and one pagers and Jupyter notebooks that were created um, or shared for the data help desk. And then here at HEU, we are again sharing resources. Um, we're tweeting with the hashtag data help desk. Um, and if you are a data help desk volunteer, if you would just put that in the chat, I would love to know who is volunteering um, as part of this effort. And so the last of the um, sort of ESAP partnership building that we've been doing to cross the chasm and really to change the environment, the scientific environment, is with COPTIS, the Coalition for Publishing Data in Earth and Space Science, which brings together data managers and repositories, publishers and societies. And it does this to help scientists have a common understanding and a common experience for how they are submitting data when they are submitting their publications um, and how they're interacting with the repositories. And I think that this has been a really interesting activity. Um, the Data Help Desk has been part of COPTIS and um, I'm looking forward to um, supporting COPTIS in, as I um, head into my next phase. Um, what, do, what do we call this? So the last of the partnerships is the National Academy of Science Roundtable on Incentives for Open Science. And to me, this is where I felt like we had really made it as a community. It brings together funders, universities, societies, publishers, and scientists. And um, I think what's unique about it is it's really focused on university presidents and on upper leadership at universities as a way to change the incentives for open science. So they've come up with a toolkit and they're looking for um, people to use and implement that toolkit. And that's another thing that I think we'll be interested in following along. And what I think is most interesting is that all of the other activities that I've described in this partnership section really are activities that are um, reinforcing, they call them mutually reinforcing vectors. So they're all things that actually feed into this idea of this round table. Um, and I think that it's been so nice to sort of see that we from the grassroots had these same ideas and now, you know, having the endorsement from the National Academy um, is a really, um, I think, a wonderful way to cross the chasm and is one of those kind of aligned um, aligned partners. So I would say that even the Academy is, is, an, is another partner that we could consider. So to wrap up, where am I going? Um, I have spent the last 10 years working with ESIP and it has been a privilege. And I think what I'm seeing is the passion for and the kind of the thread that is um, coming through is really connecting data managers and repositories with the research community. And so to do that, I'm continuing to focus on this data and community. And I'm really excited to work with Julie Lowndes, who I introduced at the beginning of this talk, um, who's the founder of OpenScapes. And so I'm, I'm partnering with Julie on OpenScapes and looking forward to helping her grow the OpenScapes Champions Program, which is a mentor program for research teams sort of take what I've learned working with use of collaboration areas and help apply that community building to teams um, is something that I'm super excited about. And I think where I've seen a lot of, of early efforts in the helping researchers with their analysis, what I think I would also like to meet researchers um, where they are with their data management and data stewardship. So I'm very excited to work with researchers in this space. And Julie has, um, talked about the impact of open science um, and getting research teams to work more openly together. And one interesting thing that she brings up is that while I was born sort of digital and open, teams that are, are converting into open science don't just go to open science publicly first, but working openly together collaboratively in their research team is a first step. And when they do that, then there is a way to reframe 
analysis and data management as a collaborative effort and not an individual burden. So back to our Sisyphean stick figures, they're, they're reducing that burden. It's easier for students to participate in research, grant money goes further, um, and it, it promotes new collaborations. So I'm really looking forward to this activity. And she also says that, you know, she feels like the biggest lesson is in the power of research teams to normalize open science. And I really think this is basically the same language as saying crossing the chasm. We're looking for those early um, and late adopters um, and, you know, really making it over that, um, the chasm and then up to the tipping point. So the other thing that I'm working on in collaboration with many projects and many partners is the Fair Island Project, which offers us this real world example to prove data policies and methods and tools and techniques um, to support researchers across their entire data lifecycle from the inception of their project to the publication of their papers. Um, so this is another opportunity that I'll have to work directly with researchers. And I'm really excited to work under the leadership of Neil Davies, who manages the site. Um, the Teddy Aroa Society and the California Digital Library in particular, in particular with John Chidaki and Maria Pritzelis on the data management plan team. So that brings us back to where we started, putting data to work, the old way and the new way. The new way with community, um, and with analysis and data stewardship tools and technologies, we're shrinking the burden on the user um, for that undifferentiated heavy lifting. And we've, we've taken care of a lot of that. Um, but we've also, I think, added these things in red. We've encouraged scientists to work with repositories to manage and publish their data. We've encouraged them to use identifiers. Um, and so there's this synergy and partnership that we're seeing that's really speeding up and improving this whole process so that we can do new open science together. So preparing for this talk has allowed me to look back and see that I have had a mission um, and connect some of these dots or themes and threads that have been running through the last decade. I'm looking forward to continuing to work together with this community um, and moving forward towards open science. And with that, I'd like to thank you again for taking the time to attend this talk and for giving me the opportunity to give the talk and focus on the efforts around putting data to work and the work that all of you have done. I'd like to acknowledge my husband, Ted Haberman, who's been a thought partner um, in the development of this talk. And I would also like to acknowledge all of the people that I referenced in short videos, Ryan, Bruce, Krista, and Julie. And then lastly, I'd like to acknowledge the communities that have supported this work over time. First, the air quality community, um, in particular, Greg, Rudy, and Stefan, and all of my air quality collaborators. And then the ESIP funders and the ESIP community that have really given me the privilege of being able to explore this space over the last 10 years and um, do work that I never imagined was even possible. So with that, let's chat. Um, thank you so much for um, being here and have a good night. That was amazing. Amazing. I know that you can't see all, the rest of us applauding you, um, but you fully, my history with you, you've always uh, embraced change and innovation, and you really embraced this difficult situation of giving <laughs> A talk, not in a format that we're we're familiar with, um, but you embraced it and made it even better. Uh, I loved the commentary that you were providing and all the links to resources. Um, I encourage you, if you have a question for Aaron, please put that either in the chat box or in uh, the question and answer tab. Um, I tried to keep an eye on the chat to see if uh, any questions came through there, and uh, we did have. Uh, we had one that I, I actually thought of too. Um, maybe not the most serious question, but definitely fun. Um, how many issues uh, from Charles Ender? He asked about how many issues of the family newsletter did you write? And he said he adds, "It's an amazing foreshadowing of your future career, and what a great personal touch." So, so I that's had the to only question. <laughs> We have 
we have a little bit of a lag, everybody. So if you're watching this and it seems like we're awkward, we are. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, I, I texted my mom Carly while you were, when I saw that come in and she said she thought I only had three, uh, three family newsletters. And she also, so that was that. But then the other thing that she said, or that you probably couldn't see in the slides was how it foreshadowed many things. My parents, they've gotten a COVID dog. And um, so there was that, there was voting on, should we get a puppy? And then there was also um, only vote once. So for all of our American friends, even way back, I was, I was very concerned about voter whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Accurate voter representation. <laughs> Leslie wants to know if you got a dog, if you actually did get a dog out of that newsletter. What was the result we of that? We did get a dog out of that <laughs> newsletter. Yep, we got a dog. Great. Um, so another question that has come through is, uh, what standardization do you foresee for data visualization software? This is really hard because this is completely out of my technical space. Um, so I would encourage, I don't know if anybody in the chat has ideas about this. Um, I mean, I think standard data access formats are, um, and services are critical to visualization, but I don't have good, I don't know, Denise or Leslie, any good thoughts on this question? Um, not off the top of my head, but I know that there are people on who, who are watching this, who I'm sure have great ideas. And um, I wanted to highlight uh, one of the comments that has come through about the right person in the right place at the right time. Um, and I think there is a lot of serendipity uh, in the world of informatics. Um, and so I believe uh, we'll be able to, uh, to see some of that um, at meetings like this and other meetings. I have no comment. So I <laughs> oh, another question has come th uh, come through. Uh, please share your thoughts about data ethics, especially around um, AI and uh, machine learning. Yeah, I think that this is a, a really interesting area and the Research Data Alliance has had a lot of conversations around data ethics um, it wasn't something that we've explored explicitly in ESIP, um, but I think it also it brings up the broader conversation around diversity and equity and inclusion in informatics and needing to see representation um, in those kind of, in the development of AI and machine learning so that we don't have the biases that we're seeing right now. Very much agreed, Erin. Um, another question has come through. Do you think that the Beijing air quality experience uh, can be applied in U.S. cities with re, uh, with respect to climate change? Um, I, I, it's a little hard because I feel like the air quality in the U.S. generally is pretty good. Um, and so I think that what we have seen is that in the, air, in the air quality space that we started monitoring, there were more surface monitoring um, stations that were, were put out and um, that allowed us to improve air quality and really reduce air pollution across the US. Um, and I'm not sure how it would work for climate change. I just haven't thought about it, but I think um, what Krista did was democratize data and give people access. And I think if, you know, for key data sets, we democratize data and we give people access, I think, yes, it could definitely help US cities with respect to climate change too. And also I see Steve uh, Young um, says to tune into his <laughs> Steve, put a link Steve to if, you drop, 
Exactly. Uh, put a link to your talk, and uh, I'm sure that um, several people will be very interested uh, in what you have um, in what you have to say. Um, so, what advice might you give have for a domain researcher interested in becoming more involved in informatics? Well, I think finding finding peers. I think that often when people are starting to approach data intensive science, it feels like they become this boundary spanner where they don't fit. And um, I think that finding groups, so um, ESIP is one of those places where I think it's a, it's a really wonderful place to begin. Um, getting familiar with informatics. I think the carpentries are another kind of early entry. Um, and then um, Openscapes. I mean, I would say, I think that this Openscapes is the transformation of teams and, you know, really kind of customizing and tailoring that, um, that transition for the groups and finding those guides that have already been there, um, been there. And I do think it looks like we're getting cut off. So, um, Peter, yes, I will take this path again. It's been an honor and a privilege to do this work. And so I really appreciate you all for coming. Thank you so much, Erin. It was a joy to listen to this talk and I wish we had more time. Um, I do encourage everybody to attend the uh, SE Town Hall uh, on Tuesday, uh, look in the program. Um, and, you know, thank you, Aaron, and thank everybody for attending and good night.